Welcome everyone to tonight's meeting of Central London Local Group uh, and it, tonight's Zoom meeting is on London's butterflies and it's been given by Simon Saville and it'll be the usual format of a talk uh, followed by questions and discussion. So I'll turn you over to Simon Saville. Thank you. Thank you Andrew and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, my pleasure to be here. I'm not sure a butterfly in the presence of birds is a sensible thing, but um, uh, I'm not, at least I'm not a caterpillar. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to talk to you about London's butterflies, and um, the talk will be illustrated with um, pictures I've taken largely with my mobile phone and often in Burgess Park, as this one that you can see here of two common blues in Burgess Park with the building going on in the background. Um, this is what I'll cover. Um, and you can see there's two comma butterflies there in Burgess Park, um, which I happened to see earlier this year. I'll talk about the butterflies we see in London. Um, I'll talk about why um, London is actually quite good for butterflies and other wildlife and compare city versus countryside because it's a bit counterintuitive, I think. I'll talk about London's habitats. I'll describe a project we've just started up as butterfly conservation. I'll describe how we can help butterflies in urban areas some conclusions. Then I'll talk about my bike for butterflies, which I've done. Um, some of you may know I've just come back from a Land's End to John O'Groats cycle ride to raise money for butterfly conservation. And there'll be time for Q&A at the end. But before we get going, maybe just a bit about me. Um, I was born and bred in rural Dorset, um, Isle of Purbeck, one of the best areas in the country for butterflies. Um, and that's where my interest in butterflies and wildlife came from. Um, I retired early a few years ago, and since that time I've dedicated a lot of time and energy to butterfly conservation, my chosen charity, where I'm chair of the volunteer branch for South West London and, and the County of Surrey. Uh, I'm also a national trustee of that charity. Um, I'm also active for London National Park City, you'll hear a bit about that. Um, and I'm active for XR and, and uh, concerned about climate change. So that's kind of me. I look forward to some questions at the end of this. So I've got two aims really um, in this talk. Uh, the first is to debunk the myth. It's quite widely held that London is no good for wildlife. I suspect you guys being birders in London know that that's not true. Uh, that London actually is quite good for wildlife, but beyond that to encourage people in London particularly to explore the green spaces near where they live, near where they work, um, with the idea that you don't have to go a long way or into the countryside to see wildlife of some interest. And I think that's proven by, by uh, uh, what we see in London. So first of all, some, something about the butterflies of London. And um, as a summary, if you want a quick summary of butterflies in London, you could do worse than go to this wiki page, which I created for London National Park City. Um, which is describes the 26 species that you could see quite commonly in London. You can see more than that, um, but there's no reason why any park in London couldn't support 20 of these species quite easily. And this is just a screen grab from the from the page, but it links through to the the butterfly conservation website and just got got pictures of all the butterflies that you might see. So hopefully, as this wiki gets more well known. Um, people will be able to have one place to go to think about London's butterflies and hopefully people will edit this and it will get a better page as a result. Just a brief comment about London National Park City because it's something quite dear to my heart. Um, it's, it's, it, it was formally inaugurated two years ago, on actually on July 22nd, two years ago. And it's at the same time a place, a movement and a vision so um, it's, it's really a grassroots roots movement. We have political support for the London National Park City, um, but, but that's nice to have, but it's not really essential because it's a grassroots movement. Um, but most of all, I think it's a vision. It's a vision about how London could be better and particularly greener, healthier and wilder. And that's what I like to spend my time doing. And I recently joined as a National Park City Ranger, and there are 110 of us now who are basically volunteers, ambassadors, to spearhead that cause. Um, so if you get a little bit of history now, if you go back 40 years, roughly 35, 40 years, um, 
the, the, the publication of a book by Colin Plant, Butterflies of the London Area, some of you may know it. It, it was done, Colin was a member of the London Natural History Society, and this is one of their publications. It's kind of the go-to book for London's butterflies and it's got distribution maps and so on. And at that time, they were saying there were 21 species in inner London. The definition of inner London is a bit different to what perhaps is used now. Um, but they were talking about 21 genera species. I won't list them there, but you'll recognize many of the names. And all of those are still present today with the exception of the wall, Broad Wall Brown, which is illustrated here in the lower right, which is now absent from um, London, pretty much, maybe the odd sighting, absent from Surrey as well, actually, although it did have a sighting last year. And that seems to be a victim of climate change. Um, um, it's now in the Midlands and, and the coastal areas, pretty much only. Fast forward to today, and there are now well over 25 species, which you can see in inner London. And I've highlighted the ones which are kind of um, new appearances since that 86 book, 87 book. The brown argus in the blue family, the purple hair streak and white ladder hair streak live mostly at the top of oaks and elms. The marbled white and ringlet, which are um, uh, meadowland species. Um, and uh, so you can see quite a few more butterflies commonly now. And, and all these can be seen in and around London's, London's parks. If you go to Burgess Park, Brockwell Park, um, Tooting Common, Wandsworth Common, you can see pretty much all these species, not in every park, but in all the, in those parks combined, you can definitely see them all. <coughs> I'm just going to go through them in a bit more detail now. Um, and these are the ones that I think are familiar to most people, because these hibernate um, over the winter as adult butterflies and they appear earlier in the year. Some hibernate rather solidly and don't wake up at all, like the brimstone in the bottom right. Others, like the Red Admiral, top left, will appear on a, on a warmish day in December or January. Um, and so you, you know it's present throughout the winter. The Red Admiral used to be a, um, a migrant only to this country and is now a resident as well as a migrant. Um, and that, I think, is a result of the global warming that we've seen. Um, the 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 Peacock and uh, tortoiseshell will, you'll see in the spring, you'll also see in the summer. But actually, we see rather few tortoiseshells and peacocks in the summer. We see more in the spring than the summer. And I think that's because they are cold adapted species. In Japan, for example, the, the small tortoiseshell is, lives, is kind of an alpine butterfly living in the, in the mountains of Japan. Um, and I think it doesn't like the warm in the summer because basically the, the, the overwintering adults will mate in the spring, they lay eggs and they'll breed on nettles and come out in July or thereabouts. And basically those adults have got to survive through till the next spring when they'll mate and, and, uh, and uh, lay eggs and disperse again. Um, so that's a long time for an adult butterfly to, to survive all the difficulties of predation and weather and whatever. So I think um, that, that they find that they don't like the heat and they just find places in foliage or outhouses or sheds or whatever it might be, eaves, and they hide out, hide away. And one of our volunteers from Hertfordshire um, has been spotting the um, hibernation uh, patterns of small tortoiseshells and peacocks and showing that they're doing it earlier and earlier in the year than they used to. So I think that's, I think that's a climate change influence. I don't think there's very good data on that. That's a kind of a personal theory, um, but definitely you don't see many in the in the summer compared with what you used to. Now the comma, um, the comma butterfly, which is very distinctive, and you can see this in in places like Burgess Park. It's it's the commonest probably of those five hibernators that you see in the spring. Um, it's right at the northern limit of its range in Europe, in in, in Britain. And if you look at the the map on the right, the dark purpley dots of the distribution in the 70s, 70, 70 to 82, and the orange dots, the more recent distribution, 2010 to 2014. And you can see how it's spread northwards since uh, the 70s. And actually, since even since 2014, it's now seen, been seen right at the very north of Scotland up here in Caithness, um, towards Dunnet Head, I think. Um, and that's, um, it's, so it's moved 450 kilometers north that's about 11 kilometers a year, which is a remarkable 
um, distance for a small butterfly to fly and breed, because we know it's breeding as it goes north. Uh, again, I think that's a climate change influence, but the comma is now much more prevalent than it used to be. Um, so climate change has been one of the drivers of that, but also uh, it's switched its food plant for its caterpillars from um, hop and elm, which it used to be only feeding on, and now it feeds on nettles as well, like its counterparts, like the small tortoiseshell and peacock. And obviously nettles are very available. So this is a butterfly which has got the right climatic conditions and the right habitat and food plant, and therefore can take advantage of the warmer climate and move north at a, at a pretty fast rate. Um, then we've got five white butterflies here, and these are ones which I find really difficult to distinguish. And I really need to see them settled before I can tell them apart. Um, this one here on the top right is the orange tip female. The male orange tip has got orange tips to the wing is very distinctive. But the female is very difficult to tell apart from the from the um, small white and the green veined white and it flies with the green veined white in the spring and can be quite tricky. Uh, the brimstone which is the female is 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 yellowish sorry greenish rather than bright yellow like the male so it's easily conf confused with a large white here and the large white can be confused with a small white because large whites can be small and small whites can be large and the markings can be very similar so these, these butterflies, which are pretty regularly seen across um, London, can be difficult to tell apart. The small white is by far the commonest. So if you see a butterfly, and these are seen all across London, so it, it's probably a small white if you see one. Um, the green vein white likes cooler areas, damper areas, and doesn't fly so avidly and so it rests more. Um, so there are ways which you can possibly tell those two apart. And then we've got what I call the little brown jobs. Um, now, all of these can be seen in London's parks. The, the large skipper comes out a bit earlier in the summer, and then the, S, then the small skipper on the right, and then the Essex skipper. These two skippers, which, are, which look much like moths, but are butterflies, um, uh, are hard to tell apart and were thought to be one species until relatively recently in, in entomological terms. Uh, but the Essex skipper is distinguished by the black tips to the antennae and by the fact that um, it overwinters as an egg and the small skipper as a caterpillar. So there are definite differences between them as species, but, but they are difficult to tell apart unless you can get a head on view like this. Um, and that's an example of a camera phone shot, which you can shows you can take a reasonable close up if you're lucky enough. And then on the bottom, we've got the brown argus, which I'll talk about a bit more um, easily confused with the female common blue in the middle. And the female common blues are very variable. And then the small copper on the right, uh, which is increasingly seen throughout the summer here in London. So all these, all these six you'll see flying around uh, in, in, uh, in the summer. Now a bit about the brown argus. Um, this seems to be extending its range. It hadn't, I hadn't seen it in some parks like Burgess or Tooting Commons until a couple of years ago. Um, and now it's, it doesn't say it's common, but it's, it's regularly seen. Um, and historically, it was a chalk downland specialist and it fed on rock rose, which is a chalk plant. But now its caterpillars feed on geranium species like the dove's foot crane's bill. And as a result, it's become much more widespread. And again, you can see from this chart, which is like the comma one, the dark dots are from the 70s and the orange ones from 2010 to 2014. You can see how the range has extended massively in that time. But interestingly, the, the purpley dots um, more or less define the chalk and limestone areas and the coastal areas where sand dunes and things are of the, of the country. So you've got you know, like the Chilterns, North Downs, South Downs, Cotswolds, Dorset um, Hills and uh, Purbeck Ranges down here, Isle of Wight. So that kind of was a chalk, it's almost like a chalk map of England, but now it's spread very widely. And this is another example of a butterfly which was able to take advantage of the slightly warmer conditions because it's changed its, its um, food plants. I don't know why it changed its food plants um, and what drove it to do so, but it's opportunistically it's now um, uh, much more widespread than it used to be. Um, we only have two blues which you see commonly in London and, and, and although if you go far down to the south into somewhere like Hutchinson's Bank, which some of you may know, you will see some other blues, but mostly it's two blues. The common blue on the top, male and female. Female very variable between mostly blue and mostly brown. 
and then the holly blue, um, which has got the different undersides, the pale underside with black dots and the female with black tips to the wings there. And here she is laying an egg in Burgess Park on Lucerne, which was planted there in the last few years. The, the holly blue is seen pretty much everywhere in London. I see it in my garden. I've seen it from buses going past Kennington Park. Um, like the small white, it seems to fly throughout the whole landscape in London. Uh, and it will fly, in, fly at higher levels than, whereas the common blue flies mostly on the, near the ground and it feeds on bird foot trefoil, as you can see there. So those are our two blues. And then we've got two species which are pretty elusive. Um, and you may not have seen these unless you look carefully. These are the hair streaks, the white letter hair streak on the left and the purple hair streak on the right. The white letter feeds on elm only and the purple hair streak only on oak. Um, Tooting Common is an excellent site for both species. It's probably one of a nationally significant site for um, white letter hair streaks. It's, there's a lot of elm in Tooting Common. And people think that elm got uh, completely wiped out by Dutch elm disease in the 70s, and it didn't. It certainly got really knocked back, but enough survived to, re to regenerate, to reseed or to sucker, um, and late, latterly to be replanted by burrows as they um, planted more elm. Um, and now you can find quite a lot of elm in the countryside. Um, so you can see that one in June and July, probably over now, I think. It tends to come out quite early in June in London. Uh, and the purple hair streak is probably flying now. And the best time to see it is actually around 7 p.m. in the evening, flying around the uh, around oak trees, not necessarily right at the top, but kind of halfway up. Um, so you could go to Streatham Common, um, if you know that, behind the rookery above the, above the tennis courts, you can see them flying there at seven o'clock in the evening or seven tooting common. And if you look anywhere where there are oaks, you're likely to have a chance of seeing it. Um, it's probably vastly under recorded in London as elsewhere. Um, there's an example of under recording or, or, or lack of knowledge on distribution. This is the white letter hair streak and every colored in square here, which you can see this is, this is our area of London, Brixton, Wandsworth, Wimbledon, Croydon, Sutton, etc. Each of these two kilometer squares is a known record contains known records of the of the hair streak in 2016 and and since then up until now really but before 2015 we only had records from three two kilometer squares in that whole area so the butterfly was almost certainly present but we just didn't know about it um and so you know there's a lot we don't know about butterflies their distribution and their abundance but it doesn't mind very urban areas and this some of you may recognize this as Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. This is the games area. There's a stand of elms, 25 or so uh, disease resistant elms planted by the council. These are New Horizon cultivars. And we're about 150 meters from the MI6 building. So it's a very urban environment. Not much else around apart from these elms. And yet white letter hair streaks can be seen flying uh, some this year, some last year and the year before on the elms just here. They're quite a remarkable little butterfly. If you haven't seen the white letter hair streak, I'll try and show you a video. I hope it comes through on, um, on stream. If not, you'll see a copy of the slides later and you can look at it. But this is taken in Peckham Rye Park. If you know that park, the formal gardens called Sexby Garden are here towards the south end of the park. And there's an elm, avenue of elms there. Again, disease resistant elms planted by Southwark Council. I think this used to be called Elm Walk or something similar and they replanted with elms 10, 15 years ago um, in order to recreate that heritage area. This is a children's play area. So it's quite a, it's a lovely um, uh, stand of trees. And here I'll see if I this plays. So this is the, the butterflies. You might just be able to see those two butterflies there. I'll play it again. It's a bit, it's a bit small because it's taken with a mobile phone. But this is the behavior you see with the white-lettered hair streak. You, the, the males are sitting at the top of the, the tree. And when one takes off and flies into the airspace of another, the second one will, will um, take off as well. And they'll have this aerial combat and spiral up, um, uh, in, up into the air and go up very high. So there they go, right up there into the distance. And goodness knows where they go. But they'll come back to that elm tree later. Um, so if you're looking for white letter hair streaks and want to know you've seen them, that's what you need to look for. They don't often come down and show you, the, show you their, their, them close up. 
and they very rarely open their wings at all um, when they're when they're sitting. Oh, I don't want to do that. Stop. Um, and then we've got these six browns. Um, these fly in the meadow areas, and these are all present in the parks across London. They look pretty similar. This is the meadow brown, the biggest and probably one of the commonest. The gatekeeper is distinguished by having two white spots in the black dot there and dots on the underwing. And the small heath doesn't have the dots on the underwing. Otherwise, these three can look rather similar. The speckled wood you'll find in the more shaded areas, the wooded areas, dappled sunlight, um, and the ringlet in, in cool, long grass. Um, and this butterfly, I, on my bike ride going north, I was listening to talking to people in Cumbria, and it hadn't been seen in Cumbria before 2012, and hadn't been seen hadn't been seen in Scotland until about the same time. And now it's pretty much the commonest butterfly in July, in both areas. Um, so it's massively increased its distribution. And we'll talk a bit about the marbled white in a minute. But there's a lovely butterfly here, which you can see now. Used not to be in London's inner centre parks. Um, so four or five years ago, it was at Brockley and Ladywell Cemetery but not any further north or west. A couple of years ago, it got to Burgess Park and then I think Brockwell Park and Tooting Common and so on. So it's definitely spreading. And this is, this is a bit more of that story. Um, it likes tall grasses and its caterpillars feed on things like red fescue, which you can see in this picture here. Um, but I wanted to show this life cycle um, because we, we tend to think of butterflies as the adult insect, the flying insect. Um, but really the, the purpose of those adults is to reproduce and to disperse. That's the only thing which they, they, they need to do. But this butterfly, as you can see, spends um, most of its life, 10, 11 months as a caterpillar. So you probably ought to think of the marbled white as a caterpillar, which is its main feeding stage with a short uh, mating and dispersal phase uh, when it's really only on the wing for a couple of weeks in the summer. Um, and this is important for conservation of butterflies like the marmot white and for its survival because we need to know what it needs in the winter through, through September through to March, April time as a caterpillar and where it will be because if we don't treat our grasslands very well then we'll kill off these, these butterflies which are there as a caterpillar through their winter, winter times. And this is, shows the occupancy trend for the marbled white in Vice County 17, which is a recording description for Surrey and Southwest London. So it's the, if you like, that's the old, more or less the old county of Surrey before the GLA was constructed, um, when Surrey went right up to the, to the river and included Wandsworth, Lambeth, Southwark, Kingston, Richmond, uh, Merton, Sutton and Croydon. Um, and here, here it shows in the 80s, about 10% of the uh, tetrads, the four two kilometer squares were occupied. And now over 60%, over two thirds of the squares are occupied. So a huge increase in occupancy. Um, but that isn't all good news as I'll show in a minute. And then we've got these, I've talked about the Red Admiral already as a, as a migrant, as well as a, um, a resident and the clouded yellow on the right, not so often seen in the center of London, quite often seen down in the edges in places like Hutchison's Bank around Croydon. And I, I heard of one, heard, I think um, Czech or someone was telling me of ones in, in Bennington recently. But the Painted Lady, you will be familiar with, I'm sure. It, it sometimes comes over in very large numbers as it did in 2009. It sets off from North Africa, Morocco, when it starts to get too hot in the, in the mountains where it, where it breeds there. And it has a life cycle where it can breed from uh, uh, adult to adult through its four life stages in about six weeks. So the adults set off, they, they, they mate and breed on the way, feeding on thistles, um, and they, they lay eggs and move on. And so the, the butterflies which you see here are not only the, the original adults, but they're the, the children, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren of those um, migrants who set off from North Africa. Uh, and sometimes we see them in huge numbers and sometimes not. It depends on the climatic conditions, the airflow. And then at the end of the season, they, it seems that they all fly back south, very high up in, in the high, high winds, which are a few thousand feet up. And so not, not detected so often. Very interesting butterfly, one of the most successful butterflies in the world in terms of its distribution and 
and, uh, and occupancy. But there are less welcome visitors that we get to our shores, and these are just two of them. Um, if you've got any box trees in your garden, you may be familiar with the box moth, sometimes called the box worm or the box tree moth. Um, this is the, the normal form of it. There's a black form which, which is kind of shiny, iridescent, purpley black. Um, but the caterpillars of this moth will defoliate box hedges in no time at all. And it did that in this area of London, South London, in um, 2018, much less prevalent in 2019. I think it had eaten all the food plant um, and maybe now predators and, and pests are, are coming into balance with the with the moss, so, may, so maybe it's uh, it's not going to do that again. Uh, then on the right, you've got the oak processionary moth, which you will may well have heard of. This came in, was imported on oak trees, um, originally from southern Europe. The oak trees had the the eggs on them, and then um, the, the moth finds our climate conditions and our oaks very suitable, and it's now uh, established in southwest London, and spreading it slowly across the country. And the Forestry Commission has a program every year to try and control its spread with limited success. It's called processionary moth because the caterpillars process like this. And you need to be very careful about these caterpillars because the, the hairs are urticating. They'll give you a very nasty rash and you can get sensitized to them. Um, and so there, there is a reason to treat, but uh, yeah, it's here to stay. But here's that here's that word of caution about distribution versus abundance. And, it's sometimes a hard message to get across to people, but if you look at this chart on the right side here, you've got on the, on the, on the vertical axis, you've got abundance. So increasing abundance at the top and decreasing abundance going down, then distribution decreasing and increasing on the, on the horizontal. And this takes um, 104 species of moth from 1970 to 2016. And it comes from the Atlas of Britain's Larger Moths, which was published by Butterfly Conservation two years ago. And these are all statistically significant trends. So of those 100 or so species, um, about um, half of them are increasing in distribution. Um, but about three quarters of them, 80%, are decreasing in abundance. So you can get cases where you're, if you like, in the happy corner, where you're increasing in both abundance and distribution. And you can get cases in the in the extinction corner where you're decreasing in distribution, decreasing in abundance. But other cases where you're increasing distribution but decreasing abundance, where probably the climatic conditions are, are, are suitable for dis dispersion, but the habitat isn't there for it. So when you see you know, eighty percent of a species on a declining abundance trend, it's pretty worrying, even if the distribution trends are going positive. So it's a it's a complicated message to get across to people when I'm talking about. Oh, it's good news that the distribution trends are positive. It isn't always the case because the abundance trends may not be. And we have to do a different type of monitoring for abundance versus distribution, as I'm sure you know, with the nesting bird surveys and similar um, in, in, your, in your world. Um, but against that, there are some success, success stories. We've talked about the three butterflies on here, but I want to talk about the two locations, Warwick Gardens and Burgess Park, because these are exemplars of what what really is happening or could happen across the rest of London and the green spaces which we've got near us. So Warwick Gardens, you may know, it's a small park in Peckham, uh, about one and a half hectares to four acres, sort of, what's that, three football pitches. It's not very big. And a lady called Penny Metal, um, who's a wildlife photographer and a graphic art, graphic designer, did a six year study and ended up publishing this, this uh, blog called Insect Inside. Uh, and actually a book which goes with it, which is a lovely book called Insect Inside as well. And she found 555 species of insect and spider in this little park, which as you can see, it's nothing special. It's got a path going through it. It's got a play area. It's got a community orchard. It's got a little football area. It's got a dog poop corner. Um, and it's got hedges and things around the, around the, around the edge. It's got some immunity grassland. You know, it's, it's it will be classed as an ordinary park. Of these species some were rare and one or two were new to the uk uh, and she's gone quite a lot of um notice for doing this and rightly so and she was on um uh, spring watch uh this spring uh in episode six and she blogged about it on her insect inside blog but if you want to see her and and hear a little piece about um what she's been doing 
go to episode six of this spring watch this is spring watch start at 22 minutes 46 and you'll see her story which is which is really quite fun and uh, it's a great inspiration to us all that our parks are full of wildlife and then my what i call my home park it's about a mile from me burgess park which is pretty close to Wellington the castle this always astonishes people outside london that somewhere as close to the center can be as rich in wildlife and i know it's pretty good for birds as well as the bird as i know tell me um tell me that but it's been improved greatly in recent years largely due to the council and the friends groups and now one of its one of its keys to success, keys to success is the variety of habitats which they've which they now have so they've got pollinator banks particularly on the north side you've got wildflower grasslands like i show here with the marbled white you've got scrubby areas and wooded areas and 22 species of butterfly maybe more in that park but also all sorts of other uh, wildlife um, and it's a joy now and all the other uses of the park still go on so we've still got the bmx track the cafe the nursery you know the exercise areas uh, the, the the sports facilities and so on um, so it's a great example of what can be done in a larger park now i want to go on to have we seen why how london's parks can be quite good well let's compare countryside versus city and to do that this is an outlook over over Exmoor I think in the background but I think you know the causes of insect declines and, and biodiversity loss in general are, are intensive agriculture largely well one of the main drivers of that was the agriculture, agriculture act in 1947 but of course it started before the war um, with the change from horses to mechanized um, uh, farming the tractors and so on but also development so tarmac and concrete roads and buildings towns expanding cities expanding so uh you know the story habitat loss things getting built on or farmed uh things getting habitat that remains getting fragmented or degraded so habitat changes to management so no wildfire meadows 90 97 percent gone no coppiced woodlands etc and you add to that then chemicals being used, pesticides, fertilizers, and air pollution. And, and um, surprisingly, fertilizers and air pollution are quite significant drivers of loss of diversity in the countryside. Um, and then you add climate change onto that, and you've got a pretty toxic mixture for insects um, in, in our wider countryside. So it's not as, so bear in mind that two thirds of the, of the land area of Britain is farmed, one third for crops and one third for grazing animals. And of the crops, half of the crops we grow are fed to animals to, for, for us to, for us to eat. Um, you can see why, unless we do something about agriculture, we can't fix the countryside and its biodiversity loss. Then we look at London and, and this is our lovely city that I love so dearly. This is a view from, well, over Crystal Palace to Southwark to the Dome. Um, and there's an, it, there's, here's a half a dozen reasons why London is better than some of the countryside. And it, it's a good chapter in this book by Joseph Reichold, called, a book's called Disappearance of Butterflies. Um, and he talks about um, cities, urban centers being richer in structure than the countryside, the farmed countryside in particular. So you've, you've got more, more diversity of structure in, in the nature of the habitats. You've got more diversity of habitat itself. So you don't have monocultures in the cities, certainly not in London. There's the urban heat island effect, and I'll talk a little bit about that more, but London is typically four to seven degrees warmer than the countryside around it. Much less use of, use of fertilizer and pesticides. Um, certainly the boroughs are tending not to use pesticides in the parks now, largely because it costs money, but um, under pressure from residents as well. The green spaces in London are pretty stable as a footprint. They don't tend to get built on, they get built up to, um, but rarely do we lose parks to, to, to development. Lots of brownfield sites, which you'll know as well as I do, are really good for wildlife. And in general, I think the green spaces in places like London are well cared for. So there's lots of reason why London is, is good for wildlife. And not least because it's green. This is a map from, it was produced for London National Park City. And the data comes from Giggle the record center for London. And it's a lovely map because you can see all the green spaces that you would know in London from Richmond Park and Wimbledon Common, Lee Valley, uh, the Royal Parks here, Hampstead Heath, uh, Mitcham Common, 
uh, and so on, and the, and the parks in the centre. But you will probably know the story that London is about 47% green space, about 22% of it is green belt, 3.8 million gardens, and over 1,600 sinks, sites of important for nature conservation, local wildlife sites, if you want to call them that. That's about 20% of the area. 140 plus local nature reserves and three national nature reserves. Um, and um, there's also all brownfield areas. So, so lots of opportunity there for wildlife, despite all the urban concrete we have in London. And just a comment about the urban heat island effect. This was a cold night in London last winter. I think we had about half a dozen cases in my area, SW9, where it went below zero. And I think it went to minus 1.8 was my lowest temperature in the garden thermometer. And this was a case at minus one at about um, six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, one morning in, in February. So on this day, I think it was minus 19 in, in north of Scotland. So a huge difference of what, what London versus the, uh, the rest of the country is. Um, and then this, I don't know whether you know the anecdote, but when London Wildlife Trust was formed in 1981, they were told, don't bother. There's only pigeons, foxes and rats in London. Um, but how wrong that proved, um, because now in the Giggle database, there are over 15,000 species recorded. And uh, I've heard people from the Wildlife Trust saying, this makes London one of the most biodiverse areas of its size in the whole country, um, simply because you've got such a huge diversity Lots of green space, quite warm. You've got the river coming in in the Thames Estuary as a gateway. You're close to the continent. You've got importing of all sorts of stuff by humans. Um, and the huge diversity of green spaces, meaning you get lots and lots of species. So I'm going to talk now a bit more in detail about the habitats we have in South London. Um, and of course, mostly it's parks and parks, commons, cemeteries gardens, brownfield spites, transport corridors, not to forgetting those, how important they are. Um, but there, there are two national nature reserves, one Richmond Park, close, of course, to Wimbledon Common and Putney Heath. And you probably know about the um, uh, South, Down, South London Downs National Nature Reserve, which is on the North Downs dip slope. It stitches together half a dozen uh, chalky areas in, in Croydon Borough. Uh, owned either by the borough or by City of London um, Corporation. And that was designated in 2019, I think. Um, and the other th interesting thing about London's green spaces uh, is that there are very rather few land managers. It's the boroughs, 32 of those, the City of London Corporation. Um, and you've got London Wildlife Trust, TCV, Na National Trust, Royal Parks. But there aren't many landowners to speak with if you want to make change in London. Lots of friends of groups who do a great job and I salute them um, and they've been really good and, and helpful in, in uh, our work in butterfly conservation in London. <clears throat> and this is really for the record for you to take away, but this this shows with the green tree symbols, a list of the sites we, up until COVID that we were monitoring regularly with Transex. So these are these are these are abundant surveys. A Transex is a walk for butterfly monitoring that's done 26 times a year, once a week, April through September. Uh, and you can see we've got good spread across this area of Southwest London, um, a lot of sites. And it, this would list probably the best sites in the, in the area for butterflies and probably for other wildlife as well. Um, I'll, I'll pick out a couple for you. The Hutchinson's Bank down here in New Addington, near, near New Addington, is probably one of the best wildlife sites in the, in the capital. Um, it's a remnant of chalk on the North Downs and is really very good. Um, of course, Wimbledon Common is excellent as well. Mitcham Common is a very large space and we, we think the area around Beddington is very good, although it's not public access. So, um, but don't discount the parks and commons you know, further north here. Some of these are very good too. Now I just want to have just give a, a couple of slides about the project we've just started as butterfly conservation called Big City Butterflies, um, uh, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. This is all about helping Londoners to connect, discover and connect with the wildlife around them, um, using butterflies and moths as the as the like the trigger for that. But it's also aiming to improve the quality and connectivity of that those green spaces and increase their suitability for wildlife 
to encourage more people to get involved in recording and monitoring and, and um, to engage with new audiences. We recognize as a charity in, involved in wildlife that we need to involve more people in urban centers, more young people and more people from like our non-traditional um, uh, demographic. We tend to be rather white middle class and getting into some of the, the, the groups which, are, which aren't white middle class is very important, particularly in London. So we want to engage with, with all sorts of um, communities and we'll probably do that mainly through schools and it's a test bed for new opportunities in conservation in urban contexts and we will spread that to other parts of the country so three themes recording and monitoring habitat management but all centered really on engagement with the local community so if we're doing habitat management it's about getting the local community to engage to help with that if we're doing recording and monitoring to getting the local community to engage and we started up now a series of activities um, and here you can see this the status so we did the development year um, before covid then we had to delay the main sponsor is the national lottery heritage fund as you can see the four branches for butterfly conservation in london are supporting it we have two project offices on board now doing great work it's a four-year project runs to 2025 and you can sign up for information and find more details at this web address if you just type in big city butterflies to to the boat to google or to butterfly concert website you you'll find it but this is a a, a really a step out project for butterfly conservation while most of our historically and most of our projects have been about habitat management in rural areas for very rare species or reintroductions or that sort of thing this is about focusing on engagement in urban centers so it's quite a different project quite a, a divergence for us um so people ask me, how, what can I do? How can I help for wildlife and particularly insects? And um, the Wildlife Trust have, have had a great campaign which they launched last year called Action for Insects, or maybe in the year before. And you can see the website link there. Um, it's got some great tips. Um, but I tend to think of five, five things for any green space. And, and uh, it's because I like to keep things simple. So if I want to help uh, butterflies and moths in particular, I'm thinking about um, and pollinators in general, I guess. Nectar for the adults, all season. So, you, so insects and butterflies and insects tend to have a long season in in, um, in London because of the the urban heat island. So you need to have early spring nectar and late uh, autumn nectar, uh, and then you need to feed what I call feed the kids. So what are the caterpillars going to eat? And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Then you need to have shelter. Butterflies, moths, insects need to shelter overnight and in bad weather and over, over the winter. And of course, no chemicals. And then I say a pond, however small. So that was your recipe. And if in the smaller the green space you have available, the more you focus, it, focus I think, on nectar for adults. So visiting a um, species rather than resident species, if you like, to your garden. But the point here is, is what's good for insects is good for wildlife. And what's good for wildlife is good for us. So we know that if you've got insects, if we're seeing butterflies, it means the right flowers are there. And if you've got the right flowers, you'll have other insects like bees, poll other pollinators, beetles, you'll have spiders. And if you've got all that, you'll have birds and, and, and bats and small mammals and so on. So you s the presence of insects is a good indicator of the quality of the ecosystem overall. So although I focus on butterflies, I'm, I'm interested in doing something for all wildlife uh, in, in our urban centers. So if you think about what, a, how do I help butterflies in particular, how do they spend the winter? Um, and then I took 24 species which breed in inner London. And, and surprisingly, if you like, that there are only five which spend the winter as an adult and only three as, a, as an egg, the two hair streaks and the Essex skipper. And this is a purple hair streak egg, that's a purple hair streak butterfly on, um, on oak taken with my mobile phone a couple of years ago. Um, a few spend the winter as a chrysalis, but nearly half of them spend the winter as a caterpillar. So they will hibernate as a small or medium sized caterpillar somewhere in the grass or foliage. And so what we do with our, our, our grassland areas is pretty important to how butterflies survive the winter. And here's that list of caterpillar food plants for London's butterflies. Again, I like to keep it simple and it's a list of 10. I've cheated because I put three trees under number 10, but you know, um, 
grasses for the browns mainly. I don't mean rye grass. I mean the 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 more um, finer grasses like coxfoot, which is here, fescue or bents. Uh, it's what sort of things you get in wildflower meadows. Nettles for the tortoiseshells and peacocks and so on. Nasturtiums and other brassicas for the whites. Birds for trefoil, vetches and lucerne for the blues. Garlic mustard, cuckoo flower for the um, orange tip and, and green veined white. Sorrels and dock for the small copper. Uh, geranium species for the brown argus. Thistles for the um, uh, painted lady. Ivy for the holly blue. And then oak for purple hair streak. Buckthorn for brimstones and elm for white leather hair streaks. It's not a long list that you need to have in place for things to be breeding. And I just make a shout out for ivy here. Um, I always make a plea for people to leave ivy on their walls or hedges or fences or wherever, not to not to cut it down. It's a it's a it's a great source. It's it's the food plant of the holly blue during the winter during the late season. Uh, it's a great source of late season nectar. You'll see it brimming with bees in October November uh, and hoverflies and things like the the ivy mining bee now. Uh, you'll see it with red admirals and so on in the in that period as well. Uh, and it provides great shelter for butterflies, moths, other insects, spiders and so on, and nesting birds. And so please don't take the ivory away would be my my uh, my main plea. Um, the other thing that can be done is more sensitive management of parks. And I mentioned how Burgess Park was a success story. Here's a couple of pictures from two years apart. Uh, I know one's a winter picture and one's a summer picture, but um, I forgot to take a summer picture in 2017. But believe me, this was a new uh, wildflower meadow in 2019. Um, and it was actually brim brimming with browns and marbled whites and blues and so on you know, last year and the year before. Um, <clears throat> I wanted just to give a couple examples from my bike for butterflies, which I just recently completed. Now cycling from Land's End to John O'Groats to raise money for butterfly conservation. That's me starting on the 22nd of June. These are examples of wildflower meadows in urban centers. So I've got one in here in the center of Bristol with some, some lovely um, uh, wildflowers here. And this is, I believe, corky fruited water dropwort, uh, which is a lovely white plant. And there is a field of that or um, an area of that in at the top of uh, Sydenham Hill, uh, Cottonston House, I think it is. Um, quite a rare plant, but you can see that can thrive in the center of Bristol. Same thing in Accrington. These people here created a wildflower meadow it's a few, it's a kind of half a football pitch size, but they scrape the topsoil off, um, uh, put the topsoil up in the corner for a, a bund where all the nettles grow, and then planted wildflower seeds on the remaining um, poor soil. And got it in, in, that was in 2018. And three years later, they've got a wildflower that is brimming with butterflies, 18 species of butterfly there. So it can be done in Accrington. This is a missed opportunity in Shuttle Harrow um, Park in Glasgow. Well, wouldn't it be great if that wasn't mown to death and was a wildflower meadow, but hey, you can't win them all. But elsewhere in Glasgow, in the parks, huge diversity of, of plant, and you can see a moth there, that's a burnet moth. Lots of um, orchids uh, here um, growing in an urban park. And then again here at a place called Fallon, which is, which is a mining town, both in the town and on the Bing. The Bing is a, um, an artificial coal hill um, and that was actually full of wildflowers um, and lots of insects there as well. Um, and then to Coronation Meadows, you'll be familiar, I think, with Coronation Meadows, which were put in place uh, for the Queen's Jubilee. One here in Caithness, one per county, one in Caithness at, near Dunnet Head, and one um, in the Forest of Boland in Lancashire. I visited both of these. Um, and these are again brimming with wildflowers and the, and the insect life which goes with them. And all these places share one thing. So what, you know, what do the, these places have in common? What they have in common as successful wildflower meadows is low soil fertility. Um, and the grasslands which we're trying to retain and create uh, need to have low soil fertility. And there's been a campaign started actually yesterday by Plant Life, Butterfly Conservation and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust uh, in, in the lead up to COP26 to try and encourage the protection and enhancing of grasslands, um, making the point that grasslands uh, are actually a very good way 
Uh, I mean, I don't mean amenity grasslands. I mean wildflower grasslands. A very good way of locking up carbon in the soil. Uh, five times better than uh, amenity grassland, and much quicker than planting woodlands. So this this website you can go to, Grasslands Plus. Uh, you can sign up there and send a letter to your MP and uh, ask them to do things to ensure grasslands are protected. But if you want to create nutrient, low nutrient soils, which I said is, is what you need, you, you need to have a way of doing it. And one way of doing it is to take away the topsoil. And this is down at Hutchinson's Bank near Croydon. You can see on the left side here, the topsoil was scraped away to reveal the chalk. And this was four or five years ago. And this has not been mown or cut in that time. And you can see it's brimming with wildflowers, but no, no scrub. On the area which hasn't had the topsoil scraped away, dogwood is taking over already. And this will soon become a secondary scrubbed area and woodland in due course if it's not treated. So um, low fertility soils really promote um, uh, wildflowers. And one way you can do that if the soil isn't too rich is to repeatedly cut and collect mowing regime. So you let the grass grow to a couple of feet tall, as long as you can, cut it and take it everything, everything away, and repeat, repeat, repeat. Every time you do that, you take the nutrients in the soil have gone into the foliage and is taken away. And after a year or two, you can have reduced the soil fertility and there's less to cut each time. And then you, you sow it using a native flower mix and cut late in the season when you come to cut it. So this has been pioneered in Dorset um, and shown that they can save money, the council there. It's now been adopted by the Highways Agency as a regime for all major road verges now and new, new, new road schemes. And there's an article in The Economist from this week or last week um, about, about this. Um, so it's quite possible to create wildflower, flower rich meadows in, in parks and in your own garden, in fact, if you really want to. Um, so I think most parks in London could support 20 or 25 species of butterfly. So I'd like to see this as a make, make this a target. This is a concept on the right, doesn't exist as a as a, as a real thing yet, but a butterfly friendly park has more than 20 species, perhaps, which mean more of those good things and less of those bad things. So um, why not? You know, um, I think it's a perfectly achievable aim. So as we come to conclusions now, um, I think I've shown you that London is good for wildlife, good for butterflies. Um, I think you can see that, the, that with all the things that are going, that are there, Plenty of opportunities for big city butterflies there to, to, um, uh, to get people involved. Um, there are simple things you can do that aren't expensive to help wildlife and creating wildflower meadows is probably one of the best things you could possibly do apart from putting a pond in. And just finally, what's good for nature is good for us. So, you know, it's, 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 um, there's, a, there's a selfish reason for doing this because spending time in nature is good for us all. Um, and if you do want to record butterflies, just a plug for the I Record Butterflies app. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but you can go to the App Store on, on uh, Apple or Android, download it for free and use it to, to record butterflies, but also to identify butterflies and get a little bit of information about them. And it will tell you what's flying in your, in your area at this time of year. And so it's quite helpful if you um, want to um, identify something you're not quite sure of. And it's free to have, so why not? And all the records you, you submit, you know, go into um, the database and then they go to Giggle and they go to Butterfly Conservation and can be used to, to look at um, uh, distribution and to some extent abundance of species. <clears throat> so in closing, I just want to acknowledge um, Butterfly Conservation, the charity, all the work they do, all the volunteers, the army of volunteers that supports them. You think about the transects we've got in in just in the London part of our area, 34 transects being walked 26 times a year um, is a huge effort. Um, all the Friends of groups, which are so good now in terms of wildlife and other things around the parks and green spaces, the boroughs. Um, and there are, another of, there are other Zoom talks on these topics, either on Big City Butterflies or on Wildflower Meadows, which you can see on this website as the YouTube recordings. And again, thanks to the Heritage Lottery Fund for their support. And just finally, um, I did this ride from Lanza to John O'Groats to raise money for butterfly conservation. Um, and I did it the slow way, as it were. So uh, normally this ride is about 
900 miles, I did a 1200 mile ride because I wanted to visit as many nature reserves as I could, many wildlife sites, I did over 40, 44, I think it was. Um, uh, and I wanted to, to see all the wildlife and talk about it uh, and raise money for butterfly conservation. I think so far we've raised over 30,000 pounds for the charity. So uh, it's a good effort and uh, I'm now having a bit of a rest. So with that, thank you. You can see my email address and Twitter handle there if you want to to um, uh, to get in touch. And let's say the slides can be made available and the recording I believe is available, will be available for you later. So now we're over to, to questions, I think, uh, Jack or Andrew, I'm not quite sure who's gonna manage that. But... Graham, are you signaling? Yeah, um, I was interested in butterflies changing their food plants. Um, is that likely to happen with others or is it just kind of random thing that happens and just they suddenly some feed on a new plant and it it works and they breed and is that what happens <laughs> i don't know um uh, i i'm people who breed I, i've bred butterflies and moths you know for fun when i when i was a kid I used to find caterpillars and and um you know you you would bung in a few leaves of different things and see what they would eat um and i think people who breed um, butterflies and moths will know that that they will sometimes feed on uh, leaves of a different food plant to the ones the books say um, if they're hungry. So I think I think it's it's probably a bit Darwinian in terms of in terms of natural selection. They, they wander off and they try something and it works, and so they do it do it again, um, and then they thrive. So I, I don't know what triggers them to do it. It must I, I suspect it's a shortage of their main food plant leads them to, to arrive on something else. But whether the female butterfly, because the females can tell what the plant is that they're laying, they're laying on, um, they can sense the different plants. They only lay normally on the right food plant. So whether the female has, has selected a different plant or whether the caterpillar has wandered to a different plant, I don't know. But it's, it's more common than I think we, we think. And I wouldn't believe what the books say always about what butterflies are supposed to do. They don't read the books. Um, but it's a good question. I, I, we were pondering that before you before we started the talk, actually, to what, what triggers it. Thank you. Catherine. Uh, I have a very small garden and a very small part of it could be a wildflower area, <coughs> but uh, it doesn't get much sunshine. Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Not ideal, is it? Because because um, butterflies are intrinsically sun loving. They they have different techniques for they, they they can't generate heat themselves, so they need heat from the sun to to get warm enough to fly. Um, some will lie with like the, the ones that hibernate lie with their wings flat open, and they're dark coloured, so they absorb a lot of light. So black dark colours absorb more light. Others, like the white ones, sit with their wings more like this. And that's thought they bounce the light off the white wings to hit their body. So, um, and that way they get warmed up. Um, so I think shaded areas are not so good, um, either for food plants or for, for caterpillars or for adults. Um, uh, maybe something like ivy would be okay in a, in a shaded area. Um, and I think you go, you go for the nectar plants in a small garden, it's probably best to go for nectar food plants for adults rather than anything else. I look for shade tolerant native plants. Um, I'm not a great gardener, but that's what I would suggest to do and see what and try and see what happens. Right, thanks. I do get some butterflies and some Good. parts. Yeah. Thank you. James? Yeah, um, you mentioned the brown argos has sort of changed its feeding habit as um partly maybe due to climate change and us i presume be historically being at the sort of northern edge of its range do you know if further south it wasn't confined to sort of chalk and things um, when what we're now seeing is common over the rest of the range uh i'm not sure what what triggered the brown argus to change its food plant. And it, it, it may be that these, these plants are more similar than, than we know from their, the, the chemicals which the females can detect. Maybe, maybe they're more similar between the geranium species and the, and the rock rose. Um, but what, what you see is that, I think, um, 
in general, the climate warming that we've seen in Britain, um, butterflies and moths and other species haven't been able to take advantage of that supposedly more advantageous climate. Um, and the reason is thought to be because of lack of habitat and habitat connectivity. So um, I think what we're seeing with something like the brown argus and maybe the comma is, is an opportunistic, the females are presumably dispersing from, the, from their normal areas and they are, they are finding that they don't have the right food plant and probably laying on something else, I would guess. And I think that's probably opportunistic. Um, and then, and then that finds that they find that they survive and then that's natural selection and they, they thrive. Um, that would be my guess, but I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I don't know the research has actually been done, um, on that in detail. Okay. There's a lot we don't know about how, how butterflies disperse. We, 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 you think of them as rather weak and sedentary species that don't fly very far, but you know, we talked about the comma dispersing north at 11 kilometers a year. And we know the small blue, which is our smallest butterfly, uh, which has got a stronghold in Hutchinson's Bank down in the south of uh, London. Um, that can find a suitable habitat, say with kidney vetch, which is its sole food plant at present, um, six kilometers away. Quite how the female butterfly knows where to go six kilometers away to find a patch of kidney vetch, I don't know, but it seems to happen that way. Um, so they seem to be able to pick up something which we don't understand. And I, I personally don't believe that the butterflies flow disperse randomly in all directions and then happen to arrive at a at a patch of food plant. I think they must know, must have some sense of which way to go. There must be sense in the air or something which they can pick up from, from some distance away. I don't think it's entirely random. Otherwise it would be a poor survival technique. They would just end up in a smaller and smaller and smaller areas, wouldn't they? But so much we don't understand about uh, these things. Check. Yeah, a question that might relate to what you were just saying. Um, last week, somebody recorded a silver washed fritillary at Beddington, and mm -hmm. that was the first record for that site. Can you suggest why it may be that it's appeared this year and not in previous years? Uh, the silver washed fritillary crops up um, unexpectedly across London. Um, We've had records at um, uh, Stayfield Ecology Park up in Rotherhithe. Uh, we've had records at um, Tooting Common and Wandsworth Common. Um, and although the, they, the, the caterpillars feed on, on um, violets, uh, the adults seem to roam quite widely through the countryside. I don't know quite why they do it, um, but it, their, their kind of native habitat would be a large woodland. Um, if you go down to somewhere like Bookham Common, or woodland like that, um, where you've got broad open rides and the butterfly will go soaring up and down these, op these open rides. Um, but quite why it would be so far up in London, I don't, I don't know. Um, I thought I saw one in Burgess Park on um, Friday, but I don't think it was in the end. Um, but, they, but they seem to, the adults seem, seem to range quite widely across the countryside. And I don't, I'd like to know whether they were males or females. They are quite distinctively different, although it has a habit of not hanging around to let you see. Well, this one was photographed, but uh, I can I can forward the photograph to you possibly. That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting to see whether the males or or females are distributed or because um, if the females are, are are roaming widely, that's quite interesting in terms of distribution. Um, but some of these species live at quite low population densities in in places like London. And if you do that, you have to have a you have to find have a way of finding a mate. It's like you need to know where the nightclubs are if you live at a low population density, because otherwise you don't find a mate. Um, and so they will have congregation points. This is what, this is what honeybees do. And other, they, they'll have a congregation point where the drones congregate and the queens will go for mating. Butterflies will do the same thing if they live at low population densities. So uh, again, we don't much know much about the ecology of that, I don't think. I'm not surprised you've seen silver wash artilleries down at Bennington because I, I would suspect they'll be at Mitcham Common as well. And I, I would think of some of the woodlands further north in Southwark. I don't think we have that many records. They're quite easily just confused with a comma if you see a bright comma in, this, in, the, in the summer. Um, 
and don't know what, don't not quite sure. You wouldn't say, oh, I wouldn't see a fritillary, it must be a comma. Thanks, yeah. Thank you for the talk. It's very, very interesting. I assume North London is the same as South London. Has it got the same uh, group of volunteers doing, doing the work as well? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think South Londoners would ever say that North London is the same as South London, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, <coughs> um, I personally don't go north of the river very much. No, but seriously, um, there are some great sites uh, north of the river, places like Tower Hamlets, Cemetery Park, Hampstead Heath, and so on, Lee Valley, etc. cetera. Um, Rystrip Woods, um, where, where um, Purple Emperors were seen recently. Um, uh, but yes, so the, in terms of butterfly conservation, we have four volunteer branches in London, which basically take the four quadrants, you know, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, more or less. Um, and the habitats are pretty similar, I would say, although there isn't much chalk in the north, north of the river, then we have got some in the south. But I think, the, but mainly the, the the parks and commons and gardens uh, uh, are similar, and the volunteer activities are similar. So I think the butterfly assemblages will be very similar in the north. I just don't know so much about it compared with the south. But there are plenty of plenty of data there from the local branches, particularly the one in Middlesex. I think Nick was trying to get in. Nick Moore. Uh, yes, um, you haven't so far mentioned the Camberwell beauty. Huh. Uh, and I just wondered when it was last seen in Camberwell. Uh, I can't, I don't know when it was last seen in Camberwell. Um, well, I saw the one on the, on the um, old wash houses in Wells Road on, one, on Friday, but that's um, only a mural. Um, the story about the Camberwell beauty, you probably know, and I don't know if this is true, but people say that um, because this area of Camberwell was a lot of timber importing from Scandinavia, where the butterfly was was resident. The butterflies would come on the ships from Scandinavia um, and uh, be seen here as, as random migrants. And as the timber trade stopped, then the, or, or particularly when it changed to bigger ships, um, the butterfly stopped being seen so much. Um, one was seen last year in Ash, um, in Surrey, down towards Guildford area. Um, but that's the only one I know of recently. They're pretty uncommon migrants, um, I'm afraid. I'd love to see one, but I've never seen one. Check. You talked about the comma and the fact that its distribution has been expanding northwards quite rapidly. Um, but I seem to recall a couple of years ago, I got a, a, something from London Wildlife Trust saying that the abundance of, of the comma in, in the London area was declining and they wanted members to kind of participate in, in recording uh, sightings so to gather more information about it. Does that accord with your understanding? Um, from my own observations, I haven't got, I haven't looked at the abundance records for comma across London, so I, I can't speak from hard data, but for my own personal observation, the comma in the last few years has been pretty easily seen in South London uh, in the spring, uh, less so in the summer, um, but in the spring quite common, and, and it was the most common hibernator in the last few years, I would see. Um, I'm much less worried about the comma than I am about the small tortoiseshell, which seems to be struggling quite badly in the South. But I, as I said before, I, I, I suspect that might be a climate change thing where it actually likes colder weather than we've got. It's struggling to survive because um, it's just too warm. But I, don't, I don't think the comma is having that, that much difficulty. But um, yeah, I'll... I've seen you know quite a few in in South London, uh, so it's not it's not one I would think of as as, as cause for concern. I mean, it, it may be one that that, that they, they'd noticed in some of their sites hadn't been seen very often. And it's very distinctive, and it's a good one to get people to to uh, to look for. It's not my, it's not it's not what I start worrying about in London for sure. Can I sneak in another question? <laughs> uh, marbled white. You talked about it expanding. Um, I haven't yet seen one in Botwell Park. I know that it has been recorded there, but I was looking at the butterfly conservation transects for 2019 in Brockwell Park, and there was only one sighting of, mm. of it. Um, what, what steps could the park authority 
to make take to increase the abundance of it in the park, if any. Um, well, if you know Brockwell Park, it's it's got that area of open grassland in the southeast corner, I guess it would be. It looks a bit like a prairie. I think that's where it would be most commonly seen, but I, I have a gut feel that that area is is of, of open grassland, which they the, the parks have let grow and cut desire lines and paths through it, and it's rather nice. But I think it's too fertile. Um, and I think they would do a good, if they could reduce the soil fertility by using that cut and collect regime and then seed with a wildflower mix, I think that could be turned into a wildflower meadow. I don't see any reason why that couldn't happen from a, in principle point of view. I know you need different equipment and mowing equipment and so on. Um, and maybe contractors need to be changed and, and things, but Lambeth has got an in-house in maintenance team, so it should be possible. Um, but I would, I would, think that that needs to be um, really treated a bit more like a wildflower meadow than it currently has been. Right. And, and then I think it would want the meadow, the, sorry, the marble white could thrive there. But but the thing about the marble white, in, at least here I've observed, is a very short flight period, only a couple of weeks. And it seems to be that they all come out at once. So again, a strategy if you've if you for survive mating and reproduction and survival is, is one one strategy is you all come out at once males and females are there together and then quickly breed and lay eggs and then their job's done um other butterflies come out over a longer period a different strategy but i think the marbled whites is a very concentrated one so if you happen to have bad weather during the main season for the marbled white you don't see very many you're not there yeah. on the right day and that happened a couple of years ago i think so it could be that effect, but they were there, but not just not seen. Thanks. And uh, I think it underlines a bit of a challenge with the transect data method. When you've got low population numbers, um, it's very difficult to make trends from it because if you see one or none or one or three, what do you conclude? You know, it's hard to make much. It's when you see 100 one year and, and, and 10 the next, that's when you start to get get worried you know with big numbers yeah i should have said of course uh, I, I didn't the, the fate of moths butterflies and moths and birds are deep uh, are closely entwined because obviously um our butterflies and moths their caterpillars feed your birds and uh, i keep on telling people if you don't have the butterflies and moths you won't have the, the songbirds so um you know it's, it's it's a web of life that you know is, is important to understand and I think some of the plight of songbirds has been because the moth numbers have gone down and certainly people who are running moth traps and monitoring moth numbers in London this spring of this summer have found vastly fewer numbers than than previous years so it is and I don't know whether that was the cold April and wet May that we had but if you've got a, an annual life cycle that spans one year from from adult to adult severe weather events can be extremely damaging to the numbers in a population and i think we've just seen you know with april may and then deluges like sunday you know these are not good if you if you've only got one chance to reproduce and disperse i think that's that's i mean it's a different talk but that's a challenge one of the challenges with climate change that we see extreme weather events becoming more more common whether that's hot or heat or drought or wet you know all, all these things are are are, are really bad if they're extremes. I guess the same is true of birds as, as is for, for butterflies. I don't, I'm not so familiar, but I guess that must be the case. Kate? How much movement is there across the English Channel? Oh, quite a lot, quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> so um, insects are pretty good migrators um, and they can fly a long distance and even tiny insects, much smaller than butterflies and moths. There's even some insects that migrate across the uh, Indian Ocean, I'm told. I, there was a good talk about it on from the Forestry Commission series of talks about migrating insects. Um, but um, the large whites and small whites will migrate across the channel. Um, the clouded yellows will migrate. Uh, the painted ladies we've talked about um, and lots of moths. So if you're into moths, people look for a southerly airflow, um, or an airflow from the south, I mean, um, in warm conditions, and, and they will go to Dungeness or 
Portland Bill and, and look for moths which have come across the channel. And they do it in sometimes in, in, in reasonably big numbers. Um, and they, they can be tracked with radar. Um, you can track um, migrating insects with, with uh, aerial radar. And they have patterns. So the painted ladies can be tracked. I think the large whites can be tracked as well um, and appear on the radar. Uh, and what, there was a case recently of the silver wine moth, which you'll see buzzing around the um, in grasslands, migrates, and and you know um, the diamondback moth, another one. So diamondback moth is only a moth of five five millimeters long. Um, so you don't need to be big; you just need to be opportunistic and um, follow the right um, weather patterns. I don't know why they migrate. I, th I think it must be because it's it's an evolutionary strategy to find dispersal areas with new breeding grounds. They must have some control over it because they don't all migrate, only some of them do. So the channel is, is, is not as big a barrier as we would think. I think probably insects cross it more easily than, than illegal migrants actually, certainly in bigger numbers. Yeah, but I, but the, the, the unwelcome visitors I mentioned, like the box moth, uh, or less welcome visitors I mentioned, the box moth and the um, oak processionary and others like that, they, they were imported because of poor biosecurity not not by flying across the channel, although a few males of the oak processionary do fly across the channel every year, but mostly they are imported on timber, on, on plant stock. Should anybody want more detailed information on any of the topics I've covered or want to reach out, ask me a question on email, feel free. Um, more than happy to try and answer. And I, I think, the, as I said, the, the, the plight of butterflies and the plight of birds is pretty closely intertwined. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have organizations talking to each other and, and working together on wildlife um, protection in places like London, because uh, what people do for birds is generally good for other, for other wildlife as well. So, you know, um, I think we share, we share the same objectives when it comes to when it, overall. I think you're right. Your last chance to hop in people, please do. Uh, someone said that two Cumberwell beauties were bred in captivity and released in Greendale, a bit naughty. That is another problem we do see increasingly actually is people breeding butterflies and releasing them in wildlife sites. Um, we've had a, a lot of that happening. One of the main issues with that is what where is the source of the breeding population come from? Has it been taken from a in, endangered site? And if it's bought, for, which is would be, which would be bad, uh, or triple SI, which we, would be illegal. Um, and if they're bought from a commercial supplier, where did the supplier get them from? And we had that spate of releasing butterflies at weddings and so on. People thought that was a nice idea, but no, it's not generally. But if I could just take one example there, at Hutchinson's Bank, the Glanville Fritillary is, it was introduced, I believe, a few years ago and seemed to have worked out okay. Um, yeah, the, 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 yeah, and we've, we've had other releases at Hutchinson's Bank. We've seen um, Marsh Fritillary. Uh, and Duke of Burgundy there, um, and the marsh artillery has been released all across the south of England. Um, yeah, the the Glanville was released kind of a bit accidentally, I think, without much of a plan anyway. And and uh, it was then supported for a while as a as a butterfly, to really resident only on the Isle of Wight and the very fringes of the south coast in Hampshire, uh, and requires um, ribwort plantain and and some. Um, particular habitat needs. And those conditions are just about there in bits of Hutchinson's Bank. Um, so it's kind of hanging on, um, but it's got no, so it's a reasonably strong population, I guess, but it's got no way of genetically refreshing itself because there are no natural populations within probably 80 miles. I don't know how far the south of England is from Hutchinson's Bank as a crow flies, but it's certainly beyond the distance that a butterfly could, could travel. So um, you worry about an isolated populations of butterflies, as with any other organism, um, you know, it becomes genetically unstable. But the populations on the Isle of Wight aren't doing so well either. So there's another case to be made for, um, well, if you've got a butterfly which is hanging on in one stronghold and someone's introduced it somewhere else, is it actually a good case for treating both of those as with populations which you want to protect in order to have greater genetic diversity for the future and maybe maybe managing them together. I don't know. It's a London Wildlife Trust managed site, so they're in charge. And they, they're pretty clear that they don't want to manage the, the site in particular for 
the downfall fertility there are other needs to that site has being a prime example of chalk grassland and mixed mosaic habitat in London rather than Surrey the county it's a rather special site and it's certainly one of the best wildlife sites in in London not just for butterflies but for uh, floral interest as well and, and indeed I think for birds and other uh, other taxa so um, certainly a lot of Roman snails there for example um, yeah so these sites I think need to be you need to think about what you want to manage them for and I don't think managing them for the gland for fertility is going to be a very high priority when when push comes to shove personally but it's not my decision it's wildlife trust's decision but the challenge on places like that is to stop scrub invasion as you could see from this dogwood will invade massively if you don't do something about it because there are no rabbits there anymore or not enough okay i think we've reached a natural conclusion um mm -hmm. i'd like to thank simon on behalf of everyone for giving a really interesting and informative talk that as i say was uh, had the virtue of being practical as to things we could do as individuals and as part of friends groups and conservation groups and uh, wider schemes that he mentioned like the uh, parks thanks again simon i'm sure some uh, we will get in touch with you and really good stuff yeah more than welcome very happy to have been able to talk with you so if you only want anything any information get in touch more than happy lovely all right thanks a lot okay.